Hello, welcome to BEH 101, Introduction to Behavioral Health. Today we're going to be covering the history of social programs, especially in the United States. So we're going to start off in the Middle Ages, <coughs> excuse me, um, and we're going to be specifically looking at the years 1000 to 1350. And clearly, you know, we're not starting in the United States because at this point the United States was still primarily populated by the Native Americans. So we're going to start in England. And this was the era of feudalism, when the rich owned the land and the poor lived on the land in exchange for working the land. This system controlled poverty and there was no shame in being poor. It was what made society function. The Catholic Church, which was the most important social force in the West, meaning Europe, and um, when we say Europe, we're talking about the area, uh, France, part of Germany at this point, Italy, England, part of Ireland. So we're talking about really the area that was the most populous reinforced this idea by providing additional support to the poor. This system allowed rich people to demonstrate their grace and goodwill towards the poor. This process was successful because people did not move around. They were, in fact, required to stay in their community. By 1350, the feudal system was falling apart for a variety of reasons. Massive crop failures. The Crusades gave young men another career option. The bubonic plague, which wiped out millions of people. And the move to urban centers. You weren't really seeing the Industrial Revolution just yet, but you were seeing people moving out of the country and moving into cities where there was a lot more opportunities. And the church was losing its influence because there was a lot of corruption and there was a failure to stop the plague and people saw this as God turning its back his or her back on um, the church because the church was so corrupt so all of these events led to a change in how poverty was being handled so how did this impact the perception of the poor instead of productive members of a close community Poor people in cities were seen as parasites, engaging in begging, stealing, and vagrancy. At this point, the government decided that there should be punishment for certain behaviors. In England, these were known as poor laws. In 1536, England passed the Relief Act. It placed the responsibility for dealing with the poor at the local level, and it had no tolerance for idleness. And there's an old saying, idleness is the devil's hands so again this thought process that if you are idle you are not Christian so they define two types of poor people the first type were the worthy poor these were pregnant women people who were extremely ill and anyone over the age of 60 now keeping in mind in this era most people died by the time they were 40 especially poor people um, this is before there were any kind of medical, realistic medical interventions. You know, uh, antibiotics had yet to be invented. Um, if you got a broken leg, you were pretty much done for in most cases. The flu oftentimes would kill people. It still does, but it was killing people in massive numbers. They were given authorization to beg or receive government subsidies. Then we have the unworthy poor. These people were able-bodied but not working. They were deemed as vagrants and subject to punishments that included whippings, being paraded naked through town, and being sent away or being jailed or incarcerated. Repeat offenders would have an ear cut off or be put to death. Adolescents who were found begging were apprenticed to businesses as child slaves. So the poor were being punished for being poor. And the idea, again, is that if you were idle for whatever reason, you were a bad person. 
In 1601, the Elizabethan Poor Laws were enacted. These laws became the foundation of the American social welfare policy, and they established three main principles. Now, just before I get to those, let me put this in the context of where we are historically. So if you remember back to third grade when you learned in 1492 Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue. So we have the ocean blue, 1492, Christopher Columbus quote unquote discovers America. Of course, you know, he discovered a whole f millions of people already living here, but he put a flag out and he said, this is mine. Um, <clears throat> Nonetheless, by the 1500s, we began to see people coming to the United States. It was before it was called the United States of America and establishing colonies. So at this point, we do see a population of, quote unquote, white people moving into the Americas and claiming land as their own. So let's get back to establishing the three main principles of the Elizabethan Poor Laws. Number one, responsibility to help the poor lay with one's family. So it's up to the family to deal with the poverty stricken. So if the family is poverty stricken, it really doesn't help much, right? Poverty relief should be handled at the local level. And number three, if an individual cannot support themselves, they cannot move to a new community new communities did not want to support the newly arrived and again we see this today we don't want the homeless moving in to new you know to a your community moreover when a nice community finds out that low income housing is going to be built in a neighborhood the people lose their minds because oh my god property values are going to go down now so, you know, something that happened over 400 years ago is still impacting how people perceive the poor to this day. There is also a concept of indoor versus outdoor charity. Indoor relief were almshouses, which were residences for the poor, the old and the sick, and other residential institutions. Outdoor relief included the delivery of food and medicine. So if you think of Meals on Wheels, that's outdoor relief. If you think of, um, you know, places uh, where you take the elderly that don't have any family, that would be indoor relief. So let's talk about colonizing the United States. And this again, as I mentioned, started in the 1500s. Spain, France, and England sent explorers to develop colonies such as Roanoke Island and Florida. Most of these failed due to a variety of problems including harsh winters, Native Americans not being enthusiastic about their arrival, sicknesses, and fighting amongst themselves. To be a colonist, self-sufficiency was required, and this led to the American people believing that this value was paramount the most important thing you had to be self-sufficient and so when we think about american values of independence and freedom self-sufficiency is right up there so let's move on to the philosophical perspective that emerges from this idea that the colonies um, gave birth to in the 1800s, several philosophical perspectives emerged addressing or alluding to social policy and the poor. Max Weber published a book called The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. He focused on John Calvin's theory of predestination, which basically means that God decides who will go to heaven and those who will go to hell based on his infinite wisdom, not the good works one does. Calvin's principles are still practiced today in the Presbyterian religion. Basically, in a nutshell, what Calvin said is, before the earth was eformed, 
God has a book, metaphorically speaking, that lists everyone who will go to heaven and everyone who will go to hell. And we have no ability to change his mind while we are on this earth. So, Calvin claimed that no one could know God's plan. Others came to believe that some people existed in a state of grace, thereby separating the quote-unquote elect from the condemned. Weber asserted that certain behaviors became indicators of one's eternal fate. Those who engaged in hard work and good moral conduct were part of the elect, and they were going to heaven. This became known as the Protestant work ethic. It assured a state of grace. Material success, based on hard work and moral conduct, became an external symbol of salvation. Consequently, poverty became a symbol of God's condemnation. In addition to Calvinism, social Darwinism was very popular in the 1800s, and this applied Darwin's idea of the biological survival of the fittest to that of society. In this idea, socioeconomic inequality was due to biological inequality. Those who were poor were victims of biological inferiority, and their demise was necessary for society to survive. The competition for economic resources weeds out the weak members of society. And this little cartoon on the right pretty much encapsulates the entire idea of this. The gentleman says, what is social Darwinism? And the woman on the right says, survival of the richest. These philosophies argued against government social programs because it would allow the weak to survive, which would cause problems in society. Consequently, the U.S. government did not provide social programs to improve social equality or end poverty. Ideological beliefs stressed that social support would only increase immorality, laziness, and dependence. And for those of us who pay attention to uh, modern day politics, you will notice that these are the exact same arguments used by people who want to end social support programs today. In 1870, the Charity Organization Society, or the COS, was started by a pastor who believed that it was a Christian duty to help the poor. The COS acted as a clearinghouse to coordinate charity efforts among smaller agencies and churches. The COS employed, quote-unquote, friendly visitors, and that would be today's version of caseworkers, who would assess why a family was poor and then would develop a plan to alleviate their suffering. However, these quote-unquote friendly workers use social Darwinism and Calvinism as their guiding principles. Mary Richmond, who was part of the Baltimore COS, promoted the idea that the barriers preventing self-sufficiency should be addressed, not the actual reasons why a particular family was poor, but the barriers that prevented them from being self-sufficient should be addressed. Jane Addams opened the Hull House settlement in Chicago in 1889 as an alternative to religious charity organizations who stressed the worthy versus unworthy poor. When Jane Addams opened Hull House, she followed the model of a settlement house she had visited in England called Townby Hall. She believed that poverty and disadvantages resulted from problems within society, not idleness or moral deficiency. This sprang from the fact that during her lifetime, 23 million immigrants from Europe, many unable to speak English, 
and they lived in horrible conditions, and child labor was very common. The Hull House settlement, and there's a picture of it on the right-hand side of this slide, is in Chicago. Adams and her colleagues lived at the settlement house, which was in a quote-unquote bad part of town, and they targeted the following issues. Unfair labor practices, exploitation of non-English speaking immigrants, child labor, and their services range from providing education to providing child care. Hull House represented a shift away from social Darwinism and Calvinism, recognizing that social issues needed to be managed by social policy and social structures. It also changed how the public perceived the poor, especially immigrants. Then we move on to Ida B. Wells, who is pictured on the right. Wells's parents were born slaves who were freed after the Civil War. When she grew up, she started the first black newspaper called Free Speech, where she wrote about racial oppression and inequality and inequity, especially the lynching of black men in the South. Wells wrote extensively on the myth of the angry black man, as well as the idea that black men couldn't help themselves when it came to raping white women. As a response, a group of white men burned down her newspaper office. So Wells then moved to Chicago where she joined forces with Jane Addams fighting racial segregation of the schools. So, you know, at this time period, and this is the late 1800s, we're talking about a group of people who at the time women couldn't even vote, who were really making great strides in affecting and impacting the social response to poverty of the time. Then we have the Great Depression and this changed everything. In 1929 the stock market crashed leading to the Great Economic Depression. Middle class workers lost their jobs, their homes and were essentially destitute. In other words, they now were living in poverty. Unemployment hovered at 24%. That was just a general number. If you looked at minority unemployment numbers, for example, African Americans, the numbers were skyrocketing into the 70% range. Herbert Hoover, the president at time, was resistant to any governmental intervention. Well, three years later, in 1932, he was voted out of office and Franklin Roosevelt took office. In his first term, actually in his first 100 days in office, he started what was called the New Deal, the most significant social support system ever designed. It enacted the Civil Works Administration, which provided a million temporary jobs. Second, he enacted the Federal Emergency Relief Act, which provided food and relief to the unemployed. And third, he enacted the Civilian Conservation Corps, which put thousands of young men to work in parks. So within the first hundred days, he literally were putting hundreds and millions of men back to work and providing food and relief to their families. In 1935, Roosevelt created the Social Security Act, which created pensions for the elderly, unemployment compensation, aid to dependent mothers and children, and aid to the disabled. These programs help pull the country out of the depression by putting people back to work and reducing poverty. Now just to kind of give you some perspective, when people go to work they pay taxes. They pay federal income tax, they pay their state taxes and now they're paying their Social Security taxes or FICA. So by putting people to work, yes, the government was spending money, but they were also getting a return on their money via these taxes. But also when people are making money, they're also spending money on food, clothing, other items, and 
you know, today it's the same thing. When somebody has a job, they go buy a phone, they go buy a TV, they go buy clothes. So putting people to work is a way to get the economy moving. Not surprisingly, Franklin Delano Roosevelt is the only president who was elected president four times. After his fourth election, the uh, Congress passed a constitutional amendment indicating that a president could only be elected twice because for a president to be elected four times became almost a kingship in a sense. So let's fast forward to the 1970s and 80s. Beginning in the 1970s, there was a resurgence of the belief that poverty is a personal failure, such as a per poor work ethic, being unable to manage money, lacking the knowledge or skills to participate in the workforce. Ronald Reagan capitalized on these opinions characterizing poor people as cheating the social supports provided by the government. Reagan created the myth of the welfare queen, which reduced sympathy for the poor, implying they were gaming the system, i.e. because they are lazy and immoral. Um, the reality was, are there people who do game the system? Absolutely. Is it as widespread as Reagan implied? No, absolutely not. A 1987 survey in the United States showed that 74% of the adult population thought the poor were dishonest and received more help than they deserved. That's a stunning number. So let's jump into the 90s. A philosophy emerged in the mid-1990s called neoliberal philosophy, which was a political movement from conservatives that free market capitalism was a better solution than government social programs. However, there was a little tiny problem. Research conducted did not support this policy. And we're talking economic research, social research, all the research that was done, nothing proved this policy. But if you talk loud enough and shout hard enough, people don't care what the science says. In 1994, Republicans released a document called the Con New Contract with America. The plan would reform welfare and the behavior of the poor, especially when it came to sexual behavior. This document failed to account for the complexities experienced by vulnerable and marginalized populations. In 1996, the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Act was passed. It included time limits for assistance and work requirements and promoted marriage and sexual abstinence. So let's jump to today. So we're in the mid teens of the 21st century. Politically conservatives such as Newt Gingrich, that's the handsome fella on the top right, and Tea Party members believe in the Calvinist and social Darwin principles of the 1800s, especially with regard to the poor. Welfare, welfare reform is especially supported by certain Christian groups who try to draw a correlation between poverty and a lack of family values. And you know, this is the kind of thing that the people who started the Constitution back in the 1700s, you know, especially Thomas Jefferson, who wrote about the separation of church and state, we really can't confuse somebody who is poor with somebody who is immoral because there are so many issues about poverty that are out of people's control and when there is a recession or a depression people realize that finally religious leaders who promote prosperity theology like Joel Osteen and that's the handsome fella on the right on the bottom and this is the idea that God financially rewards those who have his favor 
are increasingly popular and critics have called this a war on the poor so you know we continue to ride the coattails of Calvinism and social Darwinism and we have to understand that poverty is a very complex issue is it sometimes the person's fault absolutely is it most often not their fault absolutely there are social institutional issues that have created and are pervasive for example if you have a full-time job making minimum wage you qualify at this point in time for welfare food stamps and health care and again why why is it that companies can get away with paying so little when a, a person can work a 40-hour week or 50-hour week and still not make enough money to pay rent, buy food, and have health care. So, if you have any questions, please feel free to text or email us. Otherwise, have a lovely day and uh, be nice to your fellow man.